One thing about Autopsy, too, that made that set them apart is they weren't afraid to play like the slower, kind of going for the speed. Like, we barely had any slow parts on our first couple records, you know, but Autopsy had them all over the place. They were mixing, like, Doom with, you know, death metal. Like, I can't really put my finger on it, but it's kind of like, you know, maybe like Scream Bloody Gore Death mixed with Black Sabbath or something like that. We loved it, you know. It's, it's, it's just, Awesome, pure record. brutality. I mean, just amazing songs and you know, just heavy as fuck. Really? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it was it was so heavy, you know. Yeah. I was fucking serious about your autopsy yeah. right there. My doctor can tell how much autopsy means to us. If it weren't for autopsy. Obliteration wouldn't exist in the form it exists today. I have no idea why autopsy hasn't gotten like a Nobel Prize. A Nobel Prize. <laughs> wow, yeah. that's taking us to a whole nother level. Yeah. How, how would you describe autopsy's music? Autopsy's music is a steaming hot shit that leaves you with a stinging ring asshole that is burning and it slithers and it slimes and it smells really fucking bad. I don't know if I can use that. <laughs> they were really goofy and weird and they'd always be just running around drinking Jim Beam and like, you know, asking me if I want to smoke weed like five times. I was like, no, I don't smoke weed. Smoke weed. <laughs> and then like, later on that night, like, dude, come on, man. I was like, oh, sorry, guys, I don't do that. Yeah, they were like, <laughs> they were sort of like your like weird fuck up older brothers that you like really looked up to. What's your favorite autopsy song? Wow, that's really hard, man. Like, they're all pretty fucking. It's cool. kind of like picking a favorite limb. The heaviest riff is the one at the end of a uh, charter man. She goes, down, 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 down. That's just is like so dismal sounding. It's like oh, it's like the sound of like getting a sick feeling in the pit of your stomach. Like it's the epitome of death metal to me. Like it's so fucking evil. Chuck was kind of bouncing back and forth. Um, he was uh, he was actually living in Antioch, <laughs> where Eric lives now. At the, at the time I met him, he had uh, moved up to Canada and jammed with Slaughter, and then um, decided to go to uh, San Francisco and try to start a new lineup. And that was with um, Eric from DRI on drums and another Eric playing bass. 
and that didn't last too long. And then um, I'm not sure if he went to Florida and back or not after that, but he ended up in Antioch in uh, um, sometime early 86, I guess. And he uh, was going to put an ad on a local radio station looking for band members. And um, I heard about it before it actually got aired and, and um, gave him a call and we got together and just, you know, everything fell into place pretty quick. This is pretty crazy, dude. I mean, being 17 years old and a fan of the band before I got in the band, because I was already collecting the demos, you know, get them, like, order them through them, you know, or get them at uh, one of the local record places that had stuff like that, record ball. And um, to be able to play in that band was incredible. It's just completely surreal. And, uh, you know, doing Scream Bloody Gore and, you know, the mutilation demos. Just, Totally amazing, you know, especially for that age. You know, it was a real uh, kickstart into the metal world like I never had before. The origin of this vile creation known as Autopsy goes back to August of 1987 in Antioch, California, spawned by the meeting of guitarist Eric Cutler and drummer Chris Reifert, who had recently left the band Death. The two wasted no time in forming a deadly band with a clear vision of creating the heaviest along with drumming, while Cutler would lend his guttural vocals to the song Maul to Death one of Autopsy's first creations. I was just getting out of high school and I met Chris and Chuck from Death through Steve DiGiorgio of Sadis. And they were staying in a uh, condo that was right behind my house. So we got together and shortly after that, Chuck went back to Florida and he was gonna stay there and do Death from Florida again. Uh, Chris decided he, he didn't want to go back there, so me and him formed Autopsy at that point. And man, we did a, uh, our first demo in 87. And, uh, I met Eric through uh, Steve from Sadis, and uh, we met Sadis when uh, I was still jamming with Chuck. And, uh, and then Chuck decided to go back to Florida and stay there. Kind of, and then I got the invitation to uh, go there and stay in the band. I decided to want to stay in California. and. Eric and I had met each other not too long before that, and we were like, fuck, let's start our own band, you know? So that was pretty much it. It kind of formed pretty quick. Once Chuck left and didn't want to come back, me and Chris, you know, formed Autopsy, you know, wanted to do something brutal, and that's what kind of formed Autopsy. Another outcast from the area, bassist Eric Igard, was brought into the fold, and after a few rehearsals, the trio entered ATR Studios to record the 1987 demo. It's at the end of high school. Let's see, what do you remember about recording the demo, about going into the studio? That was just fun, you know what I mean? Like I said, I've never done anything. Anyone who would listen to it, and soon the metal magazines were approaching Autopsy instead of the other way around. This was a fertile time for death metal, and Autopsy showed no hesitation in staking their claim in this brutal new world. So you did play some parties then? A little bit, yeah. Oh, okay, what yeah. do you remember about that? No, those days were, those days were fun. <laughs> you know, we're all still young then, right? Though, so it was just a great time, just playing to have fun. I think you know, and just yeah. just see what we could do. Yeah, I remember the, some of the first rehearsals was at Chris's house in Venetia. Yeah. yeah. He comes up with some crazy stuff, man. Absolutely, they're all pretty fucking bizarre. But <laughs> <laughs> we worked on one thing that's on this uh, summer survival called Christ Tonight. It was just some musical stuff. Okay. But no, there was words to it, but we never actually never put it together. We just kind of did a little bit of the music on there, which was just, you know, it was... Okay, and that's the only song you remember writing for Autopsy? I don't think I just even wrote it for Autopsy. It was just something that was in the mix when we were doing things, and, okay. you know, maybe if I would have stayed and carried on, yeah, possibly. During your time with Autopsy, you played, you mentioned you played some, some parties, and you guys rehearsed together and you did the demo, but you never actually played any shows. No. You decided to split before before they everything took off. Shows. I was I was like, you know, sorry right, guys, I gotta I got I gotta take care of business. And that's what happened. After that, he just you know was kind of not really a hundred percent into it. So you know he kind of bowed out, and then we got a guy named Ken Savari to join the band for a while, and then um, he ended up sticking around for the second demo and some live shows. The following year, we did the Critical Madness demo. Uh, Igard had left the band, and uh, Danny Corrales had joined the band on guitar at that point. Don Chandler wanted me to get into Autopsy because he knew these guys. I knew Eric's older brother, 
Uh, in high school, I met Eric's older brother, and I started hanging out with him. And we kind of joined a band, doing some rock and roll stuff. And Eric used to kind of try to sneak in the garage as a little kid to watch us play. You know, and we'd have to fucking get rid of them because we want to burn and stuff like that. But I got into autopsy through Don Chandler. I came out of Bloodbath, which is a great introduction for me into this fucking maniac type music. You know, I'm in another band in Oakland and stuff, and this guy Don wants me to join this, you know, Hopper's little brother, Hopper's little brother. And I'm not paying any attention because I'm having a good time. Autopsy was serious about music writing brilliant songs, you know, and they had their chops down. What about was more about like living an idea. You know, we were just getting wasted, drinking, we we're playing can ball, which is a gutter Oakland game at the time where you just drink beers, crush the cans, and play can ball, hey. Inspired by all things horrific, the band even found its name in the true annals of horror while reading a newspaper article about the manager of the band Bloodbath, Danny Corrales' band at the time being beaten to death with a lead pipe. The word autopsy stood out and the moniker was chosen on the spot. And in the 60s, this guy was a radical. He like blew up a pg e transformer and did some crazy stuff. But now he's managing this band, but he's a bit older than all of us. And after the manager joined the band, we had a show at the Stone in San Francisco that didn't go through. We got our equipment, we went to San Francisco to play the show, and hey, there's no show here tonight. So that night, fucking, the roadie of Bloodbath uh, was able to go upstairs and fucking club to death with a fucking lead pipe and chunks of head and stuff splattered onto the wall and blood soaked carpet. They got in his drugs, did his drugs, noticed he was still gurgling a little bit and went over and started smashing him again. So it was a bloodbath, it was fucking absolutely horrible. It's not funny, I'm not trying to make it be cool or that, that was a neat thing at all because it completely was a great guy and he deserved a lot better than to be smashed with a lead fucking pipe. I didn't know these guys yet, but this happened and uh, they were in Antioch and they were just reading the newspaper one day, which I'm sure they didn't do often. <laughs> and uh, There was a murder, you know, the manager of Bloodbath was murdered with a lead pipe and, you know, they were going to do this autopsy on him. And Chris and Eric saw that word autopsy and for some reason to them that word was cool. And so that's where the band name autopsy came from, was from this Bloodbath murder. But there was no connection yet. I wasn't yet to be, you know, meet these guys or something. So, and it's weird because I, you know, jammed with his brother, Eric's brother. But that was my initiation into the madness. And uh, luckily for Don Chandler, or luckily for me, Don Chandler got me to check out Autopsy. Anyway, that's the bloodbath murder story. So there was some little weird Oakland house parties and did some crazy. We played a show in Oregon and, you know, barely started doing things. But I quit because I wanted to join Autopsy. For a while, I played the fence, you know, kind of was in bolt for a second, but it was easy to decide what I was going to do. It was just getting kind of weird, so I just quit, and uh, I got a beer can thrown at me, and it was, you know, it was a scene. What are you going to do? But I was convinced to come check these guys out, you know, and I went and seen them at a bowling alley, and it was, it was impressive. So, uh, so I went to an audition, you know, and uh, I got their demo, their first demo, the 87 demo, and uh, you know, I did my best to learn it note for note. Soon after the release of the debut demo, Eric Igard left the band and was replaced by Ken Savari on bass. Several local shows were played with Sadis and Hex, with one of these being attended by future guitarist Danny Corrales. Corrales was in the process of being talked out of leaving Bloodbath, his band at the time, to join Autopsy by mutual friend Don Chandler. Corrales showed up at an arranged rehearsal audition and quickly showed he was up to the task by displaying his knowledge of the material from the first demo and learning the songs for the upcoming second demo to be titled Critical Madness. The true test came with his second time playing with Autopsy, which was the recording of the demo in June of 1988. The recording took place at ATR again, and the rest was history. Yeah, I was on the second demo, which was like my third practice or my second practice, I don't know. But I went and tried out with these guys, and like I said, I had learned the first demo pretty much note for note, because I, you know, I want to know, I'm not going to show up and not know my stuff. So, you know, the famous story is Chris playing hella loud, and halfway through the song, he just kind of looks at me blankly, because I'm doing it, you know, and then by the end, hitting every note fucking perfect and shit, he was all, so I got the gig, man, so, uh, yeah. So the second practice was the demo, you know, and I remember it was not too far from where I live when we went down and recorded this thing. 
But it was a lot of shit to learn in like a minute. And I remember I got the most massive fucking headache, dude. After it was done, recorded, I had to like go lay down for like a day and a half. Like a oh. records owner, Paul Hammy Hamshaw, due to a recommendation from none other than Jeff Walker of the legendary Carcass. A deal with Peaceville was struck up straight. Records, we liked, you know, the idea of working with them. Uh, and from there, we, we went up. Starlight Sound in Richmond, California. We heard about that place from uh, our friends um, Hex, the band. They had recorded there and we even stole their idea for an album cover artist. They were like, oh, Hex went to uh, Starlight and that sounds good, so let's go there. So we did that and then um, we got Kent Matthew who had done their last album cover. And There's one solo on there I didn't know I was supposed to play and Eric told me I did. And I had to like learn, you know, we went out in the hall and I had to learn something like on the spot. Like, what am I going to do there? Or forfeit the solo to him, which, you know, I'm not going to be able to stand down. What song is that? I don't know. Impending Dread. Impending Dread, yeah. Thank you. It was the first time going into a, a, a studio like that. We'd been in smaller studios before, at least for me, I'd never recorded in a bigger studio like that time. And John Marshall was the engineer on that and that was that was great. He worked with Hex before, so that was our connection with him and and uh, liked working with him as a, just a great musician, great guitar player, great guy. It was a good experience, you know, going in and it was all new, you know, to me being in sit and anticipate getting the record in my hands, you know, and being able to play it and listen to it and you know, see how intense it is. I think my seventh practice was the Severed Survival album. So on the first album, Ken actually didn't record with you. No. And it ended up being Steve DiGiorgio. Yep. The one problem that needed to be solved was the departure of Ken Cervari, leaving the band without a bass player. Friend and bass annihilator from Sadus, Steve DiGiorgio was asked to step in and fill the void, which he did with devastating results. We needed someone to play bass for Severed Survival album because we'd gotten the contract by then and everything, so it was time to book some studio time and we didn't have a bass player. So um, we could get Steve to play on it. And um, he was into it, you know, we'd been friends with him through Sadus and all that. And um, he just came down and learned the songs instantly. And, um, you know, we got into the studio in no time and then banged out the album. The album was unleashed later in the year and let the world know that Autopsy was a brutal force to be reckoned with. Death Metal would never be the same again. First time I saw Autopsy, I think I was 15 or 16, and I was really scared. I think it was the Omni in Oakland. And just remember sick fucking music that was just frighteningly disgusting and Chris Reifert specifically, that really sleazy looking scumbag covered in green slime. And yeah, I'd say that was a slight influence on me. Just a little bit, just a little bit. That that kind of tailored like the rest of my miserable life. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Autopsy. <laughs> Fuckers. The man would often play a popular club called the Omni in the rundown part of Oakland, California. On August 6, 1989, one of those shows was captured on video by the house cameras. It's like when that drum dropping happens, I just want to like launch myself off a fucking building or something, or just like take whatever furniture's there and just tear it down and start smashing it. It's so violent. 
Gassing for Air was the first song I heard, and the reason I know that is because of the drum fill. When it goes da na na da na 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 do 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 do, I thought it was the greatest drum fill I've ever heard in my life. And so that was the very first autopsy song I ever heard. And after that, Separate Survival. And like we used to say knee deep in sewage constantly, all the time. Obituary, nuclear assault. Um, it was awesome, man. Shortly after Severed Survival was released, Ken Servari rejoined the band and a European tour was booked for early 1990 with Pestilence, Bolt Thrower, and Morgoth. So that's Severed Survival, then we went to Europe right after that, so in the beginning it was just, you know, just like a whirlwind of shit going down and stuff. It was, it was all happening so fast. No, it was killer, you know, best times of my life and stuff, you know, the European tours and and all the great times we had because of all the maniacs out there. It's fucking awesome. So, thank you very much. <laughs> tell you a lot of obscure shit but it might make sense what do I have that I like that might surprise you I don't know everything is just like kind of you know from the residents to Zappa to fucking you know some fucking early carcass fucking uh, I don't know just everything but it all doesn't seem out obscure to me I don't know what's really weird yeah no I mean most mo a lot of metal and punk we listen to you know, but we listened to other shit too. We listened to a lot of Frank Zappa and, and uh, you know, Black Sabbath and, you know, just a lot of, a lot of influences probably, but. Well, speaking of influences, um, what are some of your musical influences as far as, maybe not necessarily as a musician yourself, but what were you listening to as a kid that made you want to start playing music? Uh, made me want to play, you know, guitar. You know, when I was a kid and a, an assault attack came out, I just sat in my room, you know, and just drank uh, rum and coke and smoked weed. I'm like 15, drinking rum and coke, smoking weed, and not going out, you know, on the weekends with my friends and just learning the whole assault attack album, you 
you know, on guitar and so I could figure that whole fucking thing out. So, yeah, that was the, the kind of shit I was listening to. Oh, yeah. And Black Sabbath, I love Tony Omi. You know, his heavy riffing and his, you know, love the leads he did. That was, he was a probably big influence. Yeah. Who else were some of your musical influences? I, I, I don't know if they would like show, if I say what they they, they really show, and you know, Black Sabbath definitely, you know, was a it was an influence. You know, uh, Motorhead, uh, Angel Witch, um, uh, Venom. Trouble. You know, when I was a kid, yeah, Trouble, of nice. course. <laughs> you know. Did uh, two European tours for the first album? Yeah, we did two European tours. Yeah, they were great tours. First one, Pestilence and Bullfower, and uh, we did, I remember Morgoth was a lot of fun. Yeah, we fucking had killer fucking Maniac 70s style hotel fucking mayhem going down here and there. So, uh, yeah, we were you know, trying to live the dream. As would be the pattern for autopsy, bass player problems plagued the band again as Ken Servari was asked to lead the band following the European tour. He was replaced by Steve Cutler, Eric's brother, and another European tour was booked, this time with label mates Paradise Lost. We did uh, two tours. We went to Europe twice for that album. And who was in the band at that time? The first time around it was uh, Ken Savari on bass on the first European tour, and then uh, and then um, after that we got Eric's brother Steve to play bass and he uh, went with us on the second tour and then he stayed with us for uh, the EP, Retribution for the Dead and the uh, Funeral album also. After Severed came out, you guys uh, did a couple of European tours. First one was with Ken Savari, they're both kind of for Severed Survival but his Mental Funeral hadn't come out yet on the second one. And the second European tour was done with Steve Cutler, my brother, and we did some other songs from like Mental Funeral on that one that we didn't do on the other tour. So even though the album hadn't been out yet and we did tour for that, we did do some of the stuff off of that album on that tour. to us and makes Autopsy extremely special. Every death metal band play the fastest, but Autopsy were just doing, making riffs, making music that appeal to their feeling. And you know, feelings are, uh, reflects the true darkness of their music. They have every edge. Here to record the three song Retribution for the Dead EP, which showcased Autopsy's ability 
to infuse dark, crushing doom with their already savage brand of death metal. And Retribution for the Dead, that's what the That's what was. it was, yeah, you're right. And I'm pretty sure in the grip of winter was on it. And it had that one really, like, um, the slow part in it where it starts out with a intentionally kind of weak guitar sound that doom, doom, doom. You know that riff, and then when it really finally kicks in, it's just heavy as fuck. Man. <laughs> it came out in 90, yeah, 91. It came out, and uh, it took a little bit about that. Where did you record that? That was different fur. That was our first time with different fur. Yeah. That that was recorded uh, before Metal Hero. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. And, uh, that also had uh, SD yeah, yeah, SD cover play based on that. Playing shows during that period? Um, yeah, yeah, we played a few just here and there, you know, like that Buffalo show. Dave yeah, that was right. Yeah. Probably played like the Omni or something. Um, I don't know. We didn't play a whole lot of local shows. You know, in the early days we did. It was in New York, you know, we played uh, um, Dave Death and Buffalo and some things like that. What do you remember from the Dave Death show? Not a whole lot, little bits and pieces, you know, there were some really good bands there. It was, you know, Deceased and Cannibal Corpse and just, you know, on and on. It was really good. Uh, we went on at like 2 a.m. or something like that, like super late. Uh, we just burned out and uh, just a lot going on. Uh, it was also 20 years ago. So I don't remember a whole lot. I remember we played the, uh, the uh, cassette of uh, Retribution for the Dead over the PA in the venue before I came out, we just recorded that and brought the tape to play that. I remember a whole lot. King from the Sea says he remembers me throwing up right after we played, but I don't remember that. I usually remember when I puke, and I don't think I did that time, but I could be wrong. Hi, I'm Eric. Last night we spent on an airplane. The two nights before that we spent all night in the studio, so we haven't slept in about three nights now. So we're kind of running on autopilot right now. When do you go back home? Tomorrow. About 1.30 1 tomorrow we fly home. Okay, but it's like, you got to finish mixing. Though, we're going to um, master it. Otherwise, it's going to mix. Hardcore, speed, death, it's, it's pretty raw production. Good shows. Especially in Holland. We did another tour after that, in Paradise Lost. Now that was about the same. It was real good. So, you play in California? Not very often. Basically, we, we played about six times in the Bay Area, which is, isn't that many times. But we, we've been working on like new material and getting ready to tour, so it's been really rough on us. We're going to do a show when we get back with Satan. Like Frisco? Yeah. Either it's the Stone or Oakland, the Omni. One of the two. Be a pencil play as well. November of 1990, Different Fur was visited again for the recording of the now legendary Mental Funeral album. What can you tell me about the recording of Mental Funeral? Ah, uh, shit. What are your recollections of that wasted. era? That's what I remember about Mental Funeral. We were fucked up oh, sorry. that album. Okay. But, uh, I mean, not the point where we couldn't do our jobs. Everybody did their jobs, you know, and, and then, you know party, but I remember a lot of fucking people being under a hammy from Peaceville being there. Uh, wow. We went in for mental funeral, plugged our shit in, and cranked it out and just fucking did it, really. We didn't spend a lot of time on trying to, uh, you know, change things and polish stuff up, and, you know. And uh, later I, I heard that uh, Hammy stuck around and, and, like, produced the album after we left or something. I don't know what he did, but... I don't know if, if he had something to do with the sound or not. I've, I've heard him say things that he did, and 
So if he did, you know, other than stuff he commented on, I, I don't know what he may have did, but uh, heavy fucking album. It's recognized as probably one of the better autopsy albums, I think, by a lot of autopsy fans. Yeah. Definitely. And severed and Mental Funeral. Mm -hmm. So Mental Funeral was recorded in 90? Mm -hmm. End of 90. Um, much. I think we talked about little this shreds bit. here and there, yeah. uh, man. That was the first album where we started uh, like drinking a lot, you know, while we we're <laughs> recording and you know smoking like usual and everything. And yeah, and Hammy from Peaceville was there, and a bunch of our friends were there. It was just like you know, party and having fun, and recorded the album like that. Plus, you know, oh, it was like 20 years ago too, you know, so. It's amazing what you can forget in that much time. Do you remember about the super uh, Just uh, playing different for, yeah, I mean, it was all fueled by that. There was a lot of pressure back then, too, because you had, like, your friends who, you know, kind of grew up mostly with these guys were there. And, uh, you know, you, you know you, you're going to get high, you're going to party, you're going to do what you're going to do, but when it came time to play, you better know your shit, or everyone's going to fucking, from the lowliest roadie to everyone else, is just going to fucking rail you and stuff. So there's pressure, you know, you, you, you can't fuck up, and you know, you shouldn't, but uh, so I guess, you know, that was metal time. Is there a, a particular song or album that... Mental Funeral just fucking kills it for me. Mental Funeral is one of the best death metal records ever recorded, ever, ever, could ever be recorded. I've never heard one where even, like, the drums just sound... And I've I've spun it and just spontaneously broken into head banging in my room, and been inspired uh, not to good things, but I've been inspired, and that counts for something. It was interesting to see like how they sort of progressed because they sort of took the opposite tack of every other death metal band, whereas they started out sort of relatively coherent and like quasi respectable as a death metal band and as the genre sort of got more like polished and professional they got less polished and professional and ruder and more fucked up and it was just it was really cool like it was just so cool to see somebody be like hey scott burns production fuck you check this out <laughs> and uh you know that i mean really that, that just like I said, I just made a huge impression on us because we've always sort of been the same way. We're like idiots just being like, oh, everybody else wants to play properly. Well, fuck that. We're just going to not rehearse and then go record and see what happens. <laughs> Dirty, messy, sloppy, and loud. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's like they were a band that just sort of like, you know, embodied that. And, uh, it's, it's pretty fucking cool. You know? Right. Yeah, I mean, like... Service for a Breaking Coffin is one of my all-time favorites. Dark Crusade, also, it's just like, the way it starts, it's just like you're thrown like down the fucking set. You're like, holy shit. And for, I was at Mental Funeral on, on tape, and the way all the songs run together, for years, I thought certain songs were parts of other songs. Oh, wow, <laughs> Because yeah. I just had the cassette, and then I saw them live, and I was like, oh, that's where that song is. I thought it went into this other weird thing or whatever. Um, and that whole album is just sort of, for me, it's like inseparable, but there's so many great moments. I mean, I, I like the fact that both the first albums kind of start with a song with like the accents that are about getting burned up, you know? It's like just a cool kind of motif or whatever. It's fucking great. Um, right. But yeah, I mean, it's, like I said, it's really tough, dude. Yeah, almost right. every song on the first two albums, I like equally as much. You know, I mean, yeah. those two, because they're the first two I heard, and the other ones are just stick with me. It's so funny. Yeah. Yeah. The first album? one, it's got to be Mental Funeral, because of the solos. They're so creepy. Yeah. 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 The, so the first time we heard that. Oh yeah. I'm, uh, yeah. No, I'm not. I'm not surprised at all. But it's. Yeah. And it and it and it's the, the production on that. It feels like a monster is gonna. It feels like the monster on the cover is gonna eat you. Whatever survival, it's a, it's a raw, super death metal record, but it feels like at the time, and you know, it's raw. Mental Funeral just sounds like that monster is going to eat you up. Recording Mental Funeral, or, or the songwriting for Mental Funeral, my brother Steve 
was kind of instrumental in a little bit on on a couple songs on Mental Funeral. One of them was Dead, and the other one was Hole in the Head. And and there was a little bit of some of the riffing that when I was writing the theme and, and we started jamming it, playing together with it, and both of them turned into being songs. But he kind of inspired two of those songs just by little things he was doing and, and me and him sitting down and playing with them. And one of them was dead and the other was going ahead. And, and that was that was a that was fun having his input a bit on stuff on on some of the writing for Killer. Around this time, Steve Cutler left the band, and again, Autopsy had to figure out how to fill the gap. A friend of the band, Josh Barone, had previously left Suffocation and offered to make the trip from New York to California to try out for the band. He did indeed make the journey by bus, with one bag and his bass across his back, truly the sign of a die-hard maniac. While Josh adjusted to the autopsy experience, Steve DiGiorgio stepped in once more to join. They gave me some space to write some guitar solos and, and be part of the gig. But I had to make sure I was bringing something to the table, you know, I was not going to just like, it wasn't just an opportunity for me, it was, you know, for the betterment of what autopsy is and stuff, and, uh, and I don't take that lightly, I have to make sure you know, that uh, you contribute. <laughs> anyway, yeah. The first time we played with the autopsy was uh, January of 1992, when we first opened for him. We were the local band or whatever. And uh, I just remember walking into the Omni and bringing in our little, you know, goofy ass bullshit equipment and stuff and, and watching them sound check. And it was just like one of the heaviest things I'd ever heard. That was the first time I'd seen a band just like kind of behind the scenes, like rehearsing, like working it out like regular people or whatever. And, um, you know, it was really, uh, at that point in my life, yeah, it was totally awe inspiring. Uh, you just you just see your heroes just hanging out, talking to each other, goofing off, and and playing shit from Mental Funeral, and you're just like eyes on this. <laughs> this next one's a brand new song. This one's called Squeal Like a Pig. <laughs> to play the show so you know we like did dishes and stuff just so we could make the money so, but it was pretty easy that time because we had <laughs> but we know we did it my dad drove us to the show you know it was cool so like we were just floored that you know autopsy here but huge fan so yeah it was a big moment for us Chris Ryford, after the set he puked you know first thing I when I saw Danny and his pestilence with a real consuming impulse cover that was actually banned and I thought that guy was really awesome. He talked about toys all the time. And I was like 16 years old, so that was really uh, near to me. So I thought that was pretty rad. He liked toys. I'm like, I want to grow up, I want to be like that guy. I remember uh, the, the very first time we played with, with Autopsy, January 92, right after they got off stage, <clears throat> we went backstage to whatever, get our stuff so we could load it in cold stash and pick up or whatever. And uh, Reifert comes, comes backstage and he, uh, the backstage of the Omni is cavernous. I mean, for anyone that's never been there, which probably most people would be watching this, but it's huge. And there's like a stairway leading down. So he comes right from the back of the drum riser, right at the top of the stairway, leans over the rails and just fucking pukes everywhere. And um, 
we all just were really impressed by that. Like, we're just like, dude, this guy is so cool, man. He's like playing drums and singing. They totally threw up. It was awesome. And quite a while after that, like, that was part of our slang. Like, dude, instead of being like, oh, that was cool, like, oh, that was fucking autopsy vomit. You know, I think right afterwards, like, people were like high fiving him and he's taking shots of beam and, you know, doing the autopsy thing. In June of 1992, Autopsy went back to Starlight to record Acts of the Unspeakable, their sickest and most extreme album to date. With inner artwork so graphic for the time, Peaceville was actually raided by the authorities, fueled by accounts of obscenity. Autopsy was exploring new ways to make even the most jaded metal fans cringe, while new levels of bizarre songwriting were achieved to make an overall disturbing and unsettling album. Acts of the Unspeakable, uh, that was yeah. That was Starlight also. It was in uh, Richmond on, I think it was on Cutting, wasn't it? Cutting Boulevard. And uh, they ended up getting uh, held up at gunpoint and all their equipment taken away. And so the studio was no more after that because we tried to go back there and we heard what happened. So it was in like a real just shitty part of town and, you know, just kind of. <laughs> One of those things, so, yeah, we weren't there for that, we just heard about it. Um, recording Axi Unspeakable, um, very fun to record the album itself, and it was really neat to come up with some some, some stuff to what he had written, some of the neat little things he had, and that was real fun. Aaron played bass on it. We started slicing cunt hairs and shit, can you turn that up a cunt hair? Can you just turn that, me up a cunt hair more? And the uh, engineer had a tissy fit. Acts of the Unspeakable, we went in there, I'm sure we did good. I don't know. Uh, meat, I remember writing meat. Uh, there was some stuff that went down. I'm trying, I can't remember really, Starlight. I remember Starlight, but I don't remember doing Acts of the Unspeakable there. Yeah, I believe you guys. Yeah. <laughs> this next one's new. This one goes out to all the vegetarians. bass player curse reared its head when Josh Barone left the picture. This would not, however, be the undoing of the band. A U.S. tour was booked during the summer of 1993 with free the switch to bass seemed logical and worked out quite well. Uh, I used to play drums in Immortal Fate and uh, back when tape trading was a big thing, like uh, you know, my friend Max recommended autopsy to me. Mortal Fate was going to go and record a demo and we wanted to get him to do some backing tracks. So I think I wrote to him and he like actually like called me back or something and it was just, we had him uh, come down and do some backing tracks. Hanging out at Danny's house, I overheard him talking about this tour they're going to do that they didn't have a bass player. So uh, I was like, hey, you guys need a bass player? <laughs> so I nice. went on the tour playing bass for him, kind of as a session bass player. The memorable parts were more of like, uh, Nebraska with some Nebraska ticks, you know, it was more about like off the stage, having fun with those guys and go out into the forest and, and Chris looks at himself, he's like, oh man, and like everybody starts looking at themselves and we all were covered with ticks and we run back to the tour bus, you know, and we're like scratching and itching and everybody's freaking out and we finally get calmed down and we're like, okay, everything's cool, and like, and we're watching the news and it's uh, headlines come on, Lyme disease found in Nebraska ticks and everybody just jumps up and just starts freaking out, scratching and everything. And 
those, those are some memorable times, you know. Like, luckily everybody was okay and we, you know, come out of it with a laugh. But it was pretty hilarious, you know. It's like the first week of the tour. Like, anytime anybody would. really terribly with like the dates scattered super far apart you know it would take you like you know a couple of days to get to the next show sometimes it's just not good the way it was organized and like no advertising you know like no it just sucked you know like we found out later people telling us that. I found out later you guys came around I didn't even know no one you know advertised or anything so it was a long tour and and we just kind of fell apart, you know, uh, after that tour and stuff. So it was really stressful, you know, just total, total burnout and stuff. I mean, there was definitely some good stuff too that you know you look back on and it's pretty funny or whatever. I mean, there was definitely cool parts and there was there was some shows that were really good. It wasn't like crap like the whole time, but you know, it was it was a long one. It was like I don't know, fuck, it was like three months or something like that. We were out two or two or three months. Yeah, it was super long, so, you know, it was bad for the band. For some reason, the uh, busts or near busts stand out in memory the best, you know, because on the U.S. tour alone, we got hassled by cops, like, what, three times? Vegas, Ohio, and Jersey, or New York? Was it Jersey? Jersey. Jersey that was the best one. That was that was the longest one. <laughs> Big fucking fight. Yeah. I'm, at, I'm there, and by the time we get out to the parking lot, all the bands are lined up against the bus. Chris Reifert and Danny Crowles, <laughs> <and> fucking everybody. <laughs> Big fucking everybody's lined up with their hands against the bus, getting searched. I'm like, oh fuck, we haven't even played the show Dude, yet. I had to fight. Right. on that tour in Las Vegas, I was in the manager's office talking with the club owner and and somebody busts into the manager's office or the owner's office and hey there's a you know riot outside the police are out there and it's you know crazy and so so owner jumps up and runs out I go with him we kind of run out in the parking lot and we, we get out there and what we find is there's police everywhere and our our tour bus there's every band that's on the tour with us is lined up you know, hands on our bus, and the police are searching them and going through everybody, all the bands. So, but for about 10 minutes, it was like, okay, are we going to play tonight? Is everybody going to jail tonight? What's what's going on? You know, 10 minutes later, everybody's cleaning up garbage in the parking lot. It's over. The cops get out of there, then the show continues, and it was all good again. But I remember doing that, picking up fucking trash, and I'm muttering, muttering to myself, God, oh, this wouldn't happen if I was in California. And one of the cops heard me, he goes, well, this ain't California, son. Out here, it's still the wild, wild west. <laughs> it was fucking serious, man. I'm just like, ah, oh, I wish I could choke you. Off, and I, I know for some reason, I decided to use everyone as a control experiment. So I had the off on me. Everyone else went out in there because they were laughing at me. I guess that's what it was. Everybody's like, ah, oh, Ron, you got ticks, oh, you fucking dumbass. <laughs> so I sprayed myself with the off, and then when we all went back out there and smoked a beer or whatever, watching a chainsaw massacre out in Nebraska, Lincoln, Nebraska, out in the I wilderness. Miss and ticks all over themselves, oh. picking them off. That was trippy. That's crazy. Of course, I was fortunate. I had the off, so it didn't bug me, but you just imagine watching Chainsaw Massacre with ticks crawling over all over you. That was a good one. Somewhere near LaPorte, La Iowa, I think it was. Got these firecrackers. They looked like M80s, but they were very weak, so uh, freeway around Texas. By that time, you got the idea that we'll take all these lady fingers, take the powder out of them, all about the M80 type things, put the powder in there, so they make them like in the actual M80s. Fort Worth, Texas, they gave us, I don't know, six or eight cases of this Keystone beer, so we put this big stack of beer out there, so we took a bunch of these M80s out there, lit them on fire, blowing these things up. We didn't even stop the fucking bus to change drivers. No, we didn't switch we drivers cruise control, while driving, yeah. And then that person walked up and grabbed the steering wheel. Yeah. And then one driver Crossed over, got up the and went behind that person who's holding his fucking steering wheel the whole bus while standing up, not even sitting down where they can control the wheel. Right? Oh, it was the, 
You had Danny and Chris. And I was kind of in the Eric camp where we were all about, you know, having fun and doing the shows, but we wanted to be a little bit more... Uh, I was always on the Eric side, and Eric had a lot more responsibility on his shows at that point, you know. And I, I understood that too, but like I said, for me, it's just... When the show was over, the same page musically, but just personality-wise, there were just so, sort of, you know, some tensions going on. And then that tour, just the close proximity, <laughs> it yeah. just sort of broke the camel's back, really. Yeah. We were all sort of snappy by the time that was over, because we never got enough sleep. You know, you're in Chicago, what are you going to do? You're not going to sleep. You're thinking, oh, I'm going to, you know, next time I get some days off, I'm going to sleep. But no, it never happens that way. So, you know, four days, I mean, four hours of sleep every night. It started taking a toll on us. By the time we got back to L.A., I know we were all very snappy, very at each other's throats. I mean, at that point, it wasn't even, <laughs> there didn't have to be, even be a reason. We were just out of our minds with sleep deprivation, I guess. The tour, however, did not go well and was to be the undoing of autopsy. It was poorly planned and with little or no promotion saw the band driving long distances for low attendances over a long period of time. Tensions within the band increased as a result. It started becoming real hard to like make money and try and like do these tours, you know, and, and sell merch. It's just, like really hard to make money on tour. It was cool. It was, you know, it was good to play. Even though we knew we were done, it was an immaculate split. Uh, after the tour, we were just kind of, you know, tired of it, and uh, there was a little bit of musical difference going on. Like some of us would be into Gigi Allen and the Mentors and the other half of the bus wouldn't be. And all of this doesn't even matter. But uh, but that's just, you know, the band was just going to split after this tour, you know. We just, you know, we weren't getting great response. Not people were coming out to see the show. So after living for two and a half months, I guess, in this Winnebago, we needed a fucking break. Uh, pretty much it was on the U.S. tour is, is when things kind of fell apart. And for me, you know, personally, I always felt that, you know, I would do this as long as it was fun. You know, because there was no other reason to do it. It wasn't like we were packing arenas in and opening up for the Stones or nothing. So, you know, the reason to do it was it was heavy and it was fun. And I always felt if it got to a point where I wasn't having fun anymore and it felt like I was, it was work. You know, even though it's hard work doing it too, it's both, it's fun and work. But I always felt that even though there, if, if it got to a point where there's no more fun and it's just work, felt like that, then I was going to stop doing it. And on the U.S. tour, it, that's what it got to for me. And I think the main problem was it was a shitty put together tour. There was no promotion for the dates. You know, we were going to places like New York City and not having good turnouts. And the people that were there were going, hey, nobody really knew about it. We found out today. You know, there was no promotion for the show. We got that everywhere we went on it. It's kind of by the time it was halfway over, I, I had pretty much made up my mind. When we get home, I'm just going to go back from this and not do it no more. You know, so that's kind of what happened. It was There was nothing between band members or none of that stuff really. Although we did kind of, on that US tour, it, it did kind of, we got in a band on the tour, which was dumb. And I wouldn't do that again. You know, always have somebody take care of the business shit for you. Because, because that's how I got burned out. You know, to get to the next town to play again. And you, know, you need money to make that run, you know. So I was gonna make sure we are fucking getting paid, damn it. People are getting fucking racked in the head, so. So, and we did get paid, but the tour sucked. There wasn't a lot of promotion. We ended up breaking up after that. And uh, I didn't even play music for a few years after that. I was just burned out and I was like, fuck this. You know, I think everybody knew that it was time to be done at, at that time. It was just kind of obvious to, to all three of us that we were gonna stop doing it. 
and I think we just it just kind of bluntly came out. No, we never really did like official band meeting stuff. We're gonna have this band meeting that was just it was a really short talk we had about it, just the three of us that, you know, maybe we should just, you know, record the stuff we have, you know, do a show and just, you know, be done. You know. And everybody was cool and, you know, nobody is, you know, upset or there wasn't no argument and none of that kind of stuff. We just decided to do that and go our ways and and be done. And that's exactly what we did. you know but it was great it was fun you know you know at one point I remember um, Chris got mad at me and threw a microphone and hit me in the head with it and found the end of the microphone real bad and I'm just in my opinion their most memorable riff or their most distinctive autopsy riff is is the one from dead in the middle where it's all it just sounds like fucking a, a metal funeral or something. It's right. just so evil it, it's sounding. Sort of like, it's kind of, I mean, the tempo and the rhythm is almost sort of jaunty and like, <laughs> like playful or something, but it sounds so sickening like they do shit that nobody else does. And the way they start, we were kind of all sort of going our own direction. And then those Hex, which, you know, they're from the Bay Area too, and they were kind of calling it quits. and. And I guess, you know, Danny and Chris and I knew Clint from Hex. They had things that they wanted to do, 
you know, too, and they wanted to do something different as well, and Abscess started up. And club we would play, they didn't want to have us back because, oh, you know, we like yeah. just you know, demolish the club or the stage. And a lot of that was due to Chris would have uh, this stuff that he would bring and oh, like yeah. spew, he like would those, spit colored shit yeah, all and, over. And, and it's and, not like war where it's sugar water either. It's it's permanent stuff that's, you know, they're not getting off their walls. You know? <laughs> oh my Chris God. is a maniac when it comes <laughs> to that stuff. You know? <laughs> And he would like thrash around on the stage and like just yeah. fucking go nuts. Yeah. Wow. I mean, it was like pretty much the whole band ended, you know, at the end of an abscess show, everything was like in this big pile of like just twist, like equipment and cords and just Chris like in the middle of it just wrapped up no matter what. It was like, <laughs> it was pretty crazy. In 1994 at the Berkeley Square in Berkeley, California, it was so insane. They were throwing fluids everywhere. That was an insane fluid show. I mean, there was there was so much fluid, you know, it, it, it put Guar to shame. Because at the end of the night, the bouncers and the staff held all the bands responsible for for damage to the <laughs> to the floor monitors, to the microphones, to the speakers. And it was just, I mean, not just fluid and vomit, but it was like syrup and red and caked guts and everywhere. You know, I mean, it was really, really gnarly. One of the first abscess shows early on, it was the incantation, cataclysm, them, and us. And I remember we're hanging out with Chris, talking about Scream Bloody Gore or whatever. And then he goes off for a while and comes back and he's so plowed, he's like literally like lying in the street. They're like, <laughs> they're shaking him away. Like, dude, we gotta play. And he's like, oh fuck. Gets up, first few songs it's said are terrible. He gets pretty good. Then by the end it sounds great because he's like sweat all the alcohol. It was so good. And I remember he got on one of those like rocking horses things or whatever. He put like a fucking quarter in and it goes up. <laughs> I mean, this, these dudes are fucking off the wall. Like, they're really fucking funny, you know? And what was Abscess's first album called? First album was Urine Junkies. And that was a uh, combination of uh, the three demos we'd recorded by that point. Shit fun, so... We were kind of doing both, you know, with the understanding that Autopsy was, you know, gonna quit being a band, but we needed to fulfill, well, you know, doing the last album and playing the last show, but in the meantime, you know, there was a, a little hole in time, so we, we started doing Abscess at the same time. So they kind of over, overlapped for a minute, but, you know, it seemed like a good way to do it, and, you know, everyone got to do what they needed to do. Refusing to disappear quietly, Autopsy made the decision to disband only after playing a farewell show in San Francisco and completing their final album, Shit Fun. It was recorded at Razor's Edge in November and December of 1994. Bass duties were handled by all three members of Autopsy as well as Freeway Migliori and Clint Bauer. This was easily the sickest, most depraved release from Autopsy. Heavy, disgusting, and violent, it captured the band's sentiments at the time and signified the final assault upon its 1995 release. There was still stuff in the bank, you know, and, uh, and you know, we respect the band, like we're people, but Autopsy is the band, so if you're gonna do right by that band and set your little differences aside. And uh, so we recorded Shit Fun and it came out, I think, fucking sick. You know, some of the sickest stuff. And uh, so I'm glad we did that. I'm glad we were, you know, cool enough not to be dicks and like, ooh, boo, to let everyone know. And in fact, uh, Clint Bauer from Abscess got to play bass on a few songs on the Shit Fun album. And the plan was to have Eric play a few things on the first Abscess album, even though that didn't happen, but that was kind of the original plan, just to show, because everything was cool, like no one really, you know, 
other than superficial fuck you type shit, you know. The shit fun was a bunch of material that we had written and had it ready. We were gonna, that was gonna be our next recording no matter what we did. And when we decided to stop, you know, and, and stop autopsy, we still had It's really killer and I think it got overlooked a little bit compared to some of the other stuff we did, but I don't know because of the tone of the album or the picture on the front or what, but. But I like it. I think it's. I think it's really sick shit, man. That's, especially when I listen to it now. And, yeah. So. That's a good way to put it. Sick shit. Uh, shit fun is a fucking great record, though. Shit fun. I don't think people were expecting that. It came out. It grinded way harder than most people were used to. That and that came out of the darkest period in death metal's history when people just didn't care anymore. And it was kind of unfortunate because it's a really good overlooked record. Shit fun is shit-tastic. It's a it's a shit full good time, and you're a shit if you don't check it out. Uh, shit fun was recorded in '94. Yeah, that was like end of '94. Yeah, we had a good time recording that album too. We knew the band was over and all that stuff, but. Man, we still had a lot of fun and party like crazy, man. So it was, it was good. It was actually a really oh, where was that positive recording? experience. It was at a Razor's Edge in San Francisco on Divisadero. It was supposedly the house where uh, Anne Rice wrote Interview with a Vampire or something like that. But it was a trippy old house and shit. It wasn't a whole long time after that that I did the funeral project. And that kind of came together by accident. Um, it wasn't like I wanted to go out and put another band together. So I just had a friend that was to play guitar too and we started jamming. You know, whatever burnout stage I kind of went through playing stuff, I, I, I kind of started coming out of it. And, um, and it started with me playing with, uh, with Aaron Gustafson, a friend of mine. And he plays guitar and, and he had a couple bands that he did metal stuff. We started playing guitars together a little bit and writing a bunch of music and we uh, John Schaefer, the drummer from Hex, he wasn't Hex wasn't playing no more. John was doing a, a few different bands at the at different times but he was ready to play and I got Steve DiGiorgio from Sadis and I put funeral together. Um, off of just me and Aaron playing, getting together and kicking around, you know, through Tim or who did that. And after that uh, it, it broke apart. Aaron ended up moving back to Wisconsin, and uh, and I, I shelved it. I didn't listen to it for a lot of years. It wasn't really right to probably do autopsy again because we didn't do it, and it never even crossed my mind to even do it again. Abscess was rolling pretty good by then, and I'd never even thought about it doing that. And then after funeral was done, I didn't even give it any more thought for a long time. The members of Abscess were no stranger to the bass player dilemma, and after Freeway Migliori left the band, they decided on local bassist Joe Trevisano. Also known as Joe Allen, he had played bass as Kill in the early Bay Area Black, recording and touring with the band until they disbanded in 2010. Yeah, that, that was, uh, it was a band that I joined, and the main uh, writer and, and creator of that band was uh, going strong, and he was in need of a bass player. I, uh, you know, happened to be in the right place at the right time and joined up with him. The band grew strong. We, uh, we jammed all the time and uh, just tried to get as tight as possible and uh, played just a handful of shows and recorded a demo that, you know, we actually we recorded a couple of demos and only one of them really got uh, passed around. We got some good response and ended up kind of uh, being a cult, kind of a classic I thought that was cool, but yeah, it was never, uh, you know, it, it was short-lived, but, you know, it was a good time while it lasted. And, and what years were we talking about? Um, pretty much 89 to uh, 92, and I was in the band from 91 to 92, uh, when Satanic Blood was recorded in 92, and that was the one that, the demo that really got uh, some attention. So. Have you ever seen Autopsy before? Yeah, actually, I, I uh, saw him uh, at the Omni, I saw him at uh, uh, Ruthless Inn. I was a fan of the band, you know, back then, and 
I actually uh, bumped into Chris and, and Eric. I was looking for a, a band to jam with, and um, right about the time I decided to get back into the scene, uh, I noticed an ad for uh, Abscess needing a bass player. The ad was uh, basically just placed like one time, or maybe, yeah, you know, it was mm -hmm. just kind of a fluke thing that uh, I ended up grabbing. It was in a, you know, the BAM, uh, BAM magazine. He came across that, called Chris, and said, hey, what's up, it's Joe, and, and sticking it out with Abscess since then, so. What year did you join Abscess? Um, that would have been 98. Fast forward to September of 2008, and Autopsy has entered Fantasy Studios in Berkeley, California to record two new songs for the 20th anniversary edition of Severed Survival for its 2009 release. A limited pressing of a 7-inch single titled Horrific Obsession results as well from the new tracks. This recording was initially meant to be strictly a special treat to complement the occasion and nothing more. Regardless, the classic Autopsy sound was still as strong as ever and renewed interest in the band began leading up to live setting requests and general enthusiasm never before seen, much of which coming from a whole new generation of rabid death metal fans. Um, Phil was totally into it and um, I don't, it was just kind of a, a evolution with those new songs. Um, it was going to be like one song, we're like, oh, let's do a new song and you know, that'd be cool. We ended up doing two because we couldn't decide on just one. And then uh, we ended up just finding like a ton of other stuff, old rehearsals and live shit, enough to fill up like another disc. So the, what were the two new songs called? Um, there's Horrific Obsession and Feast of the Grave Worm. So, yeah, more of the same gruesomeness. Did a little bit of recording with Autopsy. Uh, yeah, the two new songs for the uh, Seven Survival release. We did the, the, the songs that came out on a Horrific Obsession and Seven Inch. Uh, recorded based on one of those tracks. Seven Survival re-release. That's when um, we did a couple of new tracks and then things started, it started getting fun to do it. Feeling fun again to do it. You know, it wasn't work again. And so now I think I can have a balance where I can separate the shit from what's fun. Keep it good so it doesn't get all stupid again. <laughs> so, that's right. I was like, but if you guys want to sell more records, just put the name Autopsy on, on it. I, because it's... It's different, but it's close enough, you know what I mean? And he's like, yeah, I don't ever want to do autopsy without Eric, and I don't want you to ever tell me that again. And I said, okay. And he's like, and we will never speak of it again. You know what I mean? I think it shows a lot of integrity and a lot of loyalty to the concept of, of autopsy and to the friendship of Chris and Danny and Eric yeah. that they left it untouched for so long. And I yeah. think that's really classy. And, yeah. I mean, for a band that's like down and dirty and gross and disgusting, it's all. The horror films, uh, I mean, some of them are cool now. It's, 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 some of them, when they put a lot of that computer shit in there, it's not, I don't think it's too good. But, uh, it just, it doesn't look real. You know, even the, the old day horror films look better with the fake looking shit on them than the computer stuff. It just had more of a, a, a dark effect, I think. So, some of the horror films out are okay right now. Um, I'd say most of them probably know not. Death Metal, I like the scene right now. It's um, It seems like it's, it's uh, there's a lot more people into it. There's a lot of young kids into it that weren't even born when, you know, a lot of these bands were out the first time and or when they first came out. And it's kind of cool to see it. It's still strong and and not dying, you know. It's 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 a cool thing and, and uh, who knows where it's going to go from here, you know. So I think it's real strong right now. Hope to see it continue. It's hard. Finally, after years of vowing that they would never be a band again, Autopsy decides to start performing and agrees to appear at several metal festivals in 2010, beginning with Maryland Death Fest. Longtime friend Dan Lilker is asked to play bass for the live appearances and rehearsals sound more crushing than ever. Joe Trevisano is then confirmed to take over on bass after the completion of the live commitments. 
With renewed inspiration flowing strongly, the members of Autopsy begin writing new material, as 2010 turns out to be an incredible year for the band and for death metal. Not only do live performances begin, but new studio recordings are planned as well. So when you found out that Autopsy was getting back together, what did you think? I was absolutely amazed. I mean, I never thought that would happen, you know, after seeing it all go down the way it did. I mean, they were always friends and that, but in terms of like playing together, I just, I never, never would have thought it would happen, you know. And when they ended up doing the couple songs for the 20th anniversary thing, that was a, a shock to begin with, you know. And uh, even then, I never would have expected them to, you know, do anything more than that. So it's all very, very surprising. It, I guess after all these years, you know, the personalities just sort of uh, <laughs> work themselves out. You know, everybody's uh, just ready to get back to do it again. You know, just love the music because it's you know classic stuff. You gotta love, you gotta love that stuff. You know, I mean, it's what can you say? You know, some of the, the primo death metal that there is. You know, I mean, it's yeah. like it's fucking autopsy and shit. Yeah. You know, so. Yeah, I got to see it oh, uh, re rehearse with Dan. Of course, Dan's a great guy. He's a, yeah. you know, badass metal bass player. And of course, he's just fucking hilarious, dude. You gotta love him. Yeah. I mean, what's not to love about Dan Wilker, you know? Yeah. I feel like I don't tell people I joined Autopsy, you know, I don't phrase it like that. I say I'm playing for them in Maryland. But, you know, I mean, uh, for all intents and purposes, when people see the band live after 16 years, you know, somebody's playing bass. So, uh, that makes me in the band for that. And then when we were taking pictures last night, I was like self-conscious, like, gee, is this overstepping my backers? <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> Topsy records at home, you know, that I would listen to and enjoy. So when he asked me to do this, some of the shit was so familiar already, but it's like, okay, well, I've heard this riff a million times, now let's see what the fuck you do it. And uh, so um, obviously it helped, and I think Chris knew when he asked me if I wanted to, to do this that uh, he was asking somebody who was like well immersed in this type of stuff and would know how to play it. and. I think these guys do it, and obviously I've known Chris for a long time, and I've played with Chris and Danny in The Ravenous, so I've already actually jammed with at least two of these dudes, and you know, we've known that we played together, and it was cool, and it was heavy and everything, and I had heard previously, you know, that Autopsy was playing, and I was one of those people going, damn, that's going to be amazing, you know, I can't wait to see that, so, like I was saying, I can't see it now, because i got to play it, but I'll get to see this DVD. It's like when Brutal Truth came back after eight years, being a band that played as fast as Brutal Truth does, I'm sure a lot of people were dubious, you know, these fucking old dudes still gonna do it. So we came back and made the most intense record we can make and said, yep, we can. You know, so I'm a cynical person myself, you know. You know, when they come back, you're like, okay, is this some kind of cash in or are these guys into doing this? And do they still have it? You know, that's another thing. A lot of bands come back. They're not, they don't sound like the classic band they were, and it's like disappointing. But uh, I don't think anyone's going to be disappointed when uh, we play. And you've, yeah, you've seen it before anybody, so. Yeah, it, was, it was pretty cool watching you guys play last night. It was just like, oh my god, this is going to be fucking awesome. <laughs>
Did you have fun at, at uh, the yeah. Maryland Death Fest? What was that experience like for you? Uh, it was uh, really, really busy and fast. It was cool. We had a great time, and it was really cool to see a lot of fans out there, you know, ready to see us play. That was a great experience. First time you played in many years. Are you all just reuniting because it's the cool thing to do? Hell no. No. No, it's it's a uh, it's not a nostalgia trip. It's not reliving something we've done in the past. It's not about as other people with bands are doing it or it's the cool thing to do. It's it has nothing to do with um, anything other than then we want to put something out there again. So we feel that we have something to offer that's new and fresh still. Brutal. And that's why we're doing it. It is a fucking great show, man. It's a lot of fun. It felt good to play that stuff again. And, and uh, we did, it was another one of those things we didn't realize it would lead to other things at first. You know, we didn't plan on doing a whole ton of stuff, but it just kind of kind of turned into that. You guys got Dan Wilker to play bass for the MDF reunion show. Uh, what was it like playing with Dan and Dan up on stage with you? It's killer. We played with Dan before. That's why it was a good idea to choose Dan. It's like he just fits right in. He's like a perfect member of the band. It was like, you know, did you feel weird? Or it's like, oh, is this guy going to be able to do it? It's, you know, it, was, it was wonderful having Danny. You know, he's a good guy. Talk a little bit about uh, Maryland Death Fest. Um, that was the first show that you played with, with Autopsy, and um, how did it feel to be on stage with them that was in front great. of all that's those people? Cherry, man. Uh, yeah. Well, that was especially satisfying that show because that had been after nine months of learning the songs and going out to rehearse in Oakland with these guys, you know, at which point I realized I could play everything. But it was really kind of satisfying. You know, it's kind of like graduating after, you know, passing a test after studying it for a long time. Yeah. Because it was more exciting than that, but uh, <laughs> no, no, just yeah. going on stage and playing with the guys and knowing that we were a cohesive unit, first of all, musically, it was very much a relief, and once that, once I knew I was going to be able to pull it off, besides that, it was just really fun to get, uh, no, it was cool, man, because it, it's something that I've been leading up for for a while, you know, because then the other two festivals, Germany and Norway, there was like two months later and then two weeks after that one, but uh, yeah, that was killer, man, because uh, it was a great feeling, you know, to uh, permanent bass player, but you know, but uh, we'd already set these shows up to do with Danny, you know, the European shows, and um, they're going to be awesome, and Danny's killer to jam with, so you know, we're looking forward to doing that. But um, you know, at the same time, Joe is now the the full-time bass player, and he's going to. You know,
too seriously there. <laughs> I almost took Joe's head off with it. Oh, man. That's good. Well, dude. So I think that's everything, right? It's a day in the office. Yeah. Well, I think at the end, it's a little point of everything. Yeah, it's seven right. hours of all that. Enter at your own risk. Okay. So, <laughs> that responsible. I gotta be hella professional. I gotta do some sit ups and push ups and not do drugs for like six weeks for my lead guitar. I gotta change my strings before each solo. And, uh, I don't care about nothing. <laughs> I don't tune. See? <laughs> yeah, we do. Uh, we're, right now, we're currently recording the tune within. Now that uh, you know, we should be done with this in, in just a couple of days here, and uh, this will be ready for release pretty soon. That's your feet. Uncover is the box. You're almost paralyzed. I'm television's Max Gale. <laughs> you might know me from Barney Miller. Die! stuff we was just like the songs wouldn't stop you know like I'd call Eric and he called me oh dude I got a new couldn't stop them coming for a minute there which is real nice so uh, yeah just feeling feeling inspired and uh, took the ones that we thought would be good for the EP and put them on there and I think I dare say we saved the best stuff for the album still It's really good. Production's really killer. It's right there. It's it's probably better than anything we've done production-wise. And songwriting's right there. It's, it's we didn't we didn't we didn't fuck around with it. We, we took our time writing material and came strong with it. So you be the judge. You tell me. What you think. Tell me a little bit about the songwriting on that. How did you guys come up with the, the uh, music? Well, by the time that we decided we're going to go for this and, and we're going to put some new shit out here, it was, uh, there was a point where me and Chris were writing new material and maybe for like a week or two, period of time, to where, and we're still writing material, we always, always come up with stuff, but there was probably a period of like a week or two. It was every day. It was like uh, we're calling each other, going, I "Got a new song? You know what do you got? Oh, really? Cool. I'm going to hear it. I got two songs. It's like, oh, okay. Well, tomorrow I'll call you with a couple too. Then you know, it's like that kind of thing. So we went back and forth a while. Where it was, and it wasn't like competition. I'm like, oh yeah, you know, or was it? Maybe I don't uh, know. Uh, no. But uh, <laughs> you know, a little both. Maybe a little both. Our plan. Good EP, you know, because we had already kind of signed on to do that at first. They seem to know we have an album worth of stuff too. And 
So that's why there's more stuff coming out because it's there. Too much shit. So, yeah. Too much stuff. So when it stops, then we won't, we won't do another one. You recorded the. Recorded. It was awesome. It, we actually ended up going five days. Adam was awesome with us, like usual, and you know he'll see it through until it's done. Songs and the way they came out, and, and we got uh, Joe playing bass with us on that, and that was good to you know get that rolling. That sounds excellent. Um, it's just it's heavy. I think anyone that likes Autopsy will, you know, probably like it. If you didn't like us before, I don't think it'll change your mind, you know. But it's, it sounds like Autopsy, so but, uh, but not like recycled shit either. You know, just, just fucking severed survival riffs, mutated or something. It's all, you know, new stuff. Except for Human Genocide, we are recycling that song. But it's a whole recycling job, not just a riff or two. <laughs> Sounds real heavy. We got Danny on that now. Finally. How important is artwork in defining the atmosphere of an album? Um, I, you know, I think to us it, it, it has a lot to do with, uh, you know, with that. It, it, when you look at an album, when, you, when you're sifting through, you know, choices on the rack, um, you not only want something to to stand out that you know is interesting, but uh, it it has to uh, kind of draw you in to what in some way tie into the artwork. And so we look for an artist that uh, is gonna is gonna kind of you know see that that side of it. Wow. death metal, I mean, that's pretty cool. People seem to dig it, and uh, they have lots of smoke and like pyro and shit like that. Yeah. So uh, it was definitely uh, quite an event. Topsy full time. Are you looking forward to playing live shows with them? Oh, definitely. Uh, yeah, I, I think it would be uh, an, an awesome feeling to be on stage with them. And, and you know, I mean, uh, we're always up for a. a uh, I believe that uh, there's uh, some plans in the making to uh, play Holland, and that'll uh, that'll happen in, uh, in 2011, early 2011. Plenty to do. Um, lots of good songs built up for it already. <laughs> Walmart. Walmart. Pay 
CVS Drugs and CVS Pharmacies yeah. near you. They make wonderful Christmas gifts. Hey Jesse, momentous. Are you filming this? <laughs> Can I sign your eyeball? <laughs> yeah, right. Open up wide. <laughs> Best wishes. <laughs> <laughs> ah, yeah, chemicals. Mm, yummy. <laughs> I thought it was done. Just for that, I'm going to have to snip some more pins. <laughs> hey, don't hog up all the pins, dude. <laughs> My son says, don't do that, Dad. It kills you. I'll save it for 20 years. I'm just yeah. getting an autograph off it. Arr. Joe Allen. Also shopping for an endorsement right now. We don't have anyone in mind in particular, of course. We're just thinking, you know, if there's ever a company that we really stood behind and would probably stand behind us. Um, uh, how many tracks all together? Uh, 12. 12 tracks. Yes. So 68 minutes. That's a pretty good chunk of, of music. It's a heaping fucking helping, man. Is that is that the, the longest album that you guys have ever recorded? Oh, That's by far. We had no idea what we were doing. That's why we're here for an extra day mixing. Um, did you guys have like a... Um, a specific um, sound that you were going for at all, or do you just want? We to just sound? want to sound like ourselves, at the risk of sounding cliche. But uh, like I said, we don't we don't want to get too modern or anything like that, and we don't want to recycle past riffs or anything. You know, uh, we got lots of fresh ideas. So uh, that was the fun of making this album. So. Just give people a, a different uh, spin on autopsy. I wanted to mention we got fucking Kent Matthew to do the cover of this DVD who did the original Severed Survival with the guy being shredded by the hooks and actually unspeakable so um, yes in that backdrop behind me right now so we got Kent doing the DVD cover which if you're seeing me babble about this crap right now then uh, hello we got Kent here you did a great job the copy you're holding in your hand right now yeah. <laughs> Hopefully you bought it. Yeah. 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 Download. Yeah. Fuckers. Fuck that. You know, they're a band that hasn't ever sold out, hasn't ever made a gay record, hasn't ever bowed to the trends of the times. So for them, to, you know, they, they have the integrity and they have the, the cold status. And it's just a great time for death metal in general for them to be coming back. And, it's just great hearing so many people finally coming out and praising bands that really deserve it. It's refreshing. If they can come back now and, you know, have some people learn about them and that, we'll see where a lot of this stuff came from. Because they're one of the original gore death metal bands. Many Norwegian bands, and I know that the and uh, and Neolist tune band. sound wouldn't be as it is today. The whole Swedish scene, you know, it's attributable to what Autumn did yeah. back in the day. What is there to say? Danny Corrales' leads are the most sick shit you've ever heard. Uh, and Chris Lavitt's songwriting and his vocals. It's magnificent. It's like nothing you've heard before. They're true pioneers. And to me, they are the true extreme metal band. Fuck it. we owe you our lives. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> Eternal hails from Norway. People need to, to look up and uh, learn a few lessons from from really the uh, 
Godfather's in death metal. The second era of autopsy is officially underway, heralded by a veritable explosion of blood spattering deathly brutality. Once again, the gore is spewing forth and the beast that is autopsy hungers for rotting meat. To quote the band, all we can do is offer more brutality. I'm gonna 